This is Dead Serious, a show about short horror stories worthy of discussion. I'm Dead Palette, and I have an above-average gag reflex. Today, we're going to be taking a look at a story entitled Blood-Stained Glory, Part 1. This is written by the ill-informed bystander who was supposed to write Fleming Storage Unit number 117, but I can't find it. I think that they might have dropped out of the contest slash project. But I will be reading uh, this uh, entry written on their Tumblr blog instead. You can find a link to it in the description below. Let's get right into it. Agatha tore a strip of cloth from the hem of her tunic and deftly ran it across the cold steel of her helmet. She had spent years shining the smooth metal to the point of perfection, of perfect reflection, but now she couldn't see herself in the conical mirror. The night before, she had sullied the perfect metal with dust to prevent it from reflecting even the slightest flash of light. But now, excuse me, but now all she was, all she saw was dried blood. So dry, in fact, that the cloth did little to remove the stains. She tried to spit on the cloth to moisten it, but she couldn't muster the saliva. Her throat was dry as sand. Besides her, beside her was, beside her on the stone bench, her slim young squire was gulping down water from a sewn up pig's bladder with such carelessness that it's, that streams were pouring out from the corners of his mouth. That's a big, crunchy first paragraph, and so what I am getting is that this is some sort of either medieval or fantasy setting. I don't know that it's necessarily going to be explicitly horror, but we can still critique whatever this is. It's kind of fun going in blind and seeing what's on offer. The way that everything is being described is very descriptive. We're getting a lot of uh, information about this uh, helmet, you know, which was once shiny and now is covered in dust and dried blood. This is very much so a, a great opening in terms of the the helmet reflecting Agatha herself um, is, is my guess is what we're supposed to be making the comparison for. So let's uh, press on. Bruce, she said, a mailed... A mailed fist held out, I guess like chain mailed is what that means. Um, I'm not, I'm not necessarily up on all of, all of the terminology that might show up here. The lad handed over the bladder. His face was a picture of shock. Wide eyed and wordless, he stared at the floor, threatening to dig through the earth, uh, with his eyes. Water had splashed down the front of his jerkin mixing with the caked mud and sticky red blood. She could no longer see her colors emblazoned on his chest. So, again, we're we're getting terminology that I'm not necessarily familiar with here, but uh, very much so... Germ- hmm, what's the term I'm looking for here? Even though this is just very plain stuff describing the setting, it's really... Th- what we are having described for us has implications outside of it, where you can build a world around this very small scene happening between these two people. Agatha poured a few drops of water on the cloth and set about removing the blood. As she wiped away the grime, she saw that the metal was damaged. A large dent had been wrought into the steel by the edge of a, s- of a sword she failed to dodge. Even with the blood entirely gone, Agatha couldn't see her face in the dulled and bent metal. So the information that we're getting is about a battle that took place, and uh, it's it's a good way of having a pseudo-flashback. This person seems to n- know what they're doing and have these techniques down pat. Even though this isn't my style of writing, I'm very much so focused on first-person narratives and that kind of thing, Uh, modern times, realistic stories, but this really does have me intrigued, so let's keep reading. The pounding of hooves in front of her drew her attention away from the task at hand. A boy no older than ten or eleven was galloping towards her. She recognized the seal on his shirt from afar, a messenger from her lord. Sir Agatha... Oh, so Agatha is a dude. Okay. 
Uh, he called out. His voice was sweet and unbroken. Sir Agatha, he continued as he drew his horse to an abrupt halt in front of her. Oh, I, I guess sir is just an honorific that's supposed to be gender neutral in this, I'm guessing? Okay. Lord Morden begged your attendance at the town square. Agatha nodded slowly. She held her hand out to her left. Bruce, she said again. The squire took the battered helmet in both hands without looking over. Agatha stood to follow the boy and immediately winced. Her leg throbbed ever so sharply with each movement. Run along, boy, she said to the messenger. I know where to find him. I'm beginning to think that this might not be horror and might not be what I'm used to reading, but in for a penny, in for a pound, or whatever currency they're using in this universe. The boy bowed his head and turned his horse to leave. Agatha looked around her. The smoke was heavy in the air, and the heat was unbearable. The town sat below the castle, and bailey walls like a bloated gut sprawled out in the semicircular fashion before terminating in a rough set palisade wall. I don't even know what all these words mean, but it's it's written so vividly and it's paced out well with different sizes of sentences in each paragraph. It's got great pacing, you know? Around three quarters of the town was a formidable moat. Uh, a formidable moat had been constructed years ago, preventing any approaching safe for the main gate, save for the main gate, which was the night which the knight ha before had sat comfortably behind many lines of earthen ditches and wooden stakes. As Agatha carefully descended the dirt road from the, t uh, from the keep to the ruined gate connecting the town to the bailey, she gazed out over all the devastation. A huge plume of smoke billowed out to the west, following the sea breeze, where once there had been a pleasant country town resting peacefully in the shadows of the Grand Keep, now there were the burned husks of homes, shops, and storehouses. Every now and again, the shrill screams of a woman pierced through the cacophony of the scraping steel, the intense destruction of homes, and the laughter of the victors. Okay, so I'm not sure if a, a battle is still going on here, but it sounds as though, it sounds like, um, you know, whoever, uh, Sir Agatha, whatever side they're on, it seems like they're in a losing battle if they have not already lost. Sir Walter Broadshield was hanging men from a willow tree as she turned the corner into a primitive cobblestone street. The road was uneven, but sl uh, curved slightly, allowing the blood to flow into the gutters where it settled and congealed with the mud. Oof. A dozen men were huddled together on the floor as men in mail dragged them forward one at a time to fix a noose around their necks and kick a stool out from under their feet. Long-haired, sweaty, and stinking of fear, the warriors that had once been the object of her fear made for a pitiful sight on the floor, surrounded only by a few steel-clad soldiers. Many were bandaged and clutching wounded limbs. Agatha watched Broadshield's l latest victim hanging from the tree between the long tendrils of the willow. A boy no older than Bruce. His face was ghoulishly gray. So maybe Agatha's side of this war had won? Um, it's kind of unclear to me when they say things like, uh, the warriors that had once been an object of her fear made for a pitiful side on the floor surrounded by only a few steel-clad soldiers. So I'm guessing that, you know, maybe she's on the side of the conquerors. A scruffy red-haired man stood up from the huddle and reached out to Broad Shield. Uh, mercy, sir, he cried. Mercy. You should have picked mercy. You put it, should have picked any kind of support. Strange. Agatha was yet to hear one of these people speaking in, in English. Any hope of his cries of anguish being able to save him were expertly dashed when Walter turned to face the man and shattered his jaw with a well-placed steel-clad fist. The red-haired man spat out shattered teeth and wailed in agony as he fell back to the floor. Hang him first, Broadshield barked at his men. 
Agatha tried to be- her best to look unimportant, but the incident was distracted, had distracted Broadshield long enough from his task to notice the limping knight as she passed by. So there's been a lot of nice storytelling in the environment, and I think that there are some great metaphors going on. The brutality of the situation is being illustrated quite expertly, uh, especially in the bits about the mud, uh, the, the blood meeting the mud because of the way that the cobblestone streets are curved. Um, this is something that reminds me, it's completely unrelated, but it reminds me of uh, Blood Alley in Chillicothe, where I grew up. There is an alley right next to a theater where during, uh, some war or a flu or something, there were a lot of dead bodies and they took them to the theater and they blood let out all of the blood into the adjacent alley. And that's pretty metal, isn't it? Um, and this story is very metal, and it is speaking of horrific things, although it might not be people's textbook idea of horror. Uh, so let's just read this for what it is and take it for what it is. But I would say that with how far we've gotten into this story, I would expect there to be a little bit more information about Agatha herself. Um, we're getting bits and pieces here, but I would like... A, what we're getting so far is that she is a stoic warrior. Um, and is, you know, there, there's this bit about she's trying to look unimportant. I like that. Um, kind of trying to seem aloof, trying to seem like they're not important, but they possibly are very important. They are the main character of our story, so far as we can tell. And this is multi, multi-part, so, you know, could be developed on in the future. Just a thought. Hail, sir, he called out, and Agatha sighed deeply. A smile flashed across his youthful face as his followers each saluted her. What a day, Broadshield continued. This isn't time for uh, lunch, and here we are supping up the spoils of victory. It isn't even time for lunch, and here we are supping up the spoils for victory. He threw his head back and laughed. Sir Walter was a young man of no more than twenty, and the youngest of Morden's retinue of knights... Retinue? Retinue? I feel like I know that word, but I'm just having this jamais vu moment of not understanding it for some reason. Of knights um, by some half decade. His, despite this, his ferocious reputation had led him to become one of the Lord's favorites right away. He was a wild eyed man with murder in his heart. By no means a wealthy man at birth. By no means a wealthy man of birth, he had taken most of what he had by brutality alone, and so far the bloody business of war had proven most profitable for him. He, as he wandered casually over to Agatha in a suit of plated steel made for another man, a golden necklace swayed from side to side across his breastplate. I like the description of this person, the brutality of them. Um, this is a great introduction to this character, and I wish that we got a little bit more um, out of Agatha in terms of, you know, kind of her backstory. But again, maybe that might be elaborated on. Uh, Hail, Sir Walter, Agatha replied. Forgive me, I have orders from Lord Morden. Of course, Agatha, Broadshield replied with a wide smile. He waved his hand back to the prisoners, still huddled together in the mud. I have my new, uh, I have my own task to attend to. Perhaps you recognize a few of them. I think a few of this lot surrendered in the keep this morning. Agatha studied the faces of the prisoners that were looking her way. Most men wore the face of total fear, but a few had come to accept their fate. It had been dark when she had stormed the keep, and between the madness of the battle and the limited flashes of light from the torches hanging of on the walls she had taken the time to study she hadn't taken the time to study any foe in detail as she made her way through the tower room by room until she was breathing the free air of the great balcony at the apex most of these men seemed too young to be the warriors she had faced in the morning perhaps she muttered but i didn't get a look at their faces Okay, so there's some aspect of mystery here of who she actually did fight. 
and whether or not it was these young men. No, Broadshield replied. I suppose you saw too much of their backs when they ran away. Uh, Sir Walter bellowed with laughter once more. His throat wobbled with each deep breath. He tried to cover his chin and neck with a beard, but his age was betraying, betrayed by the patches of skin that were clearly visible through the thin hair. Again, all of this is just speaking of such grit and brutality from a time that a lot of people don't necessarily contemplate anymore. We have uh, specific references to English language, which is telling me that this is in our reality or an alternate dimension, or perhaps as some sort of historical fiction. All right, then. Godspeed, sir, Broadshield said as he clapped Agatha on the shoulder. He turned and looked back to his men. Bring up the next one. Agatha walked off. Broadshield was too engrossed in his task to notice that she had left without a word in parting. She passed over the collapsed gate and she and made her way across the bridge connecting the town and the castle walls. She peered over the handrail and saw several bodies impaled on a series of sharpened stakes in the deep ditch below. Which side they belonged to, however, she couldn't say. And here below, uh, that's the end of part one, here below we have some tags, one of which is fantasy, fiction, historical fiction, war conflict battle, victory, winner, winner, chicken dinner, writing project, writing, you know, so this is uh, pretty interesting. Definitely not something that's typically on my alley, but it's very much so well written. If you want to continue reading the story uh, and perhaps give the ill-informed bystander some prompts, some some messages, you can find their Tumblr below and continue reading on to the next chapter of Bloodstained Gore uh, Glory. Um, I had a good time reading this. I think that I didn't have a whole lot of feedback to give, but I do think that you can get some writing lessons from this in that it's paced very well. Uh, it does a nice job of taking a very encapsulated moment. You know, just the moment between Agatha and her squire Bruce really does tell you a lot more about the world. You can extrapolate from that, and I don't think it takes a whole lot of imagination to build out uh, the setting from there. I think that we have a good point of reference for, for how to fill in the, the rest of uh, the world. I think that a lot of the times, because I don't have a giant um, lexicon of information to go to, whenever I'm reading something that's fantasy and, you know, highly acclaimed fantasy, no less, uh, you know, stuff from J.R.R. Tolkien, uh, Tolkien and, and that kind of thing, Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, Golden Compass, I don't have... Uh, the same reference points that some people do, so it's hard for me to imagine those scenarios. But here, I think that this is very approachable and uh, does a nice job of bringing in a layperson like me. So take that for what you will. Someone who's an expert on on fantasy and historical fiction in this kind of setting might be able to dump all over this story in a way that I can't, but I certainly enjoyed it. Let me know what you think. Uh, let the ill-informed bystander know what they think, uh, what you think. Um, and let's get on to our sponsor of the day, which is Blood Architecture. Blood Architecture, or Blorchitecture for short, keep your cities sanitized. 